Hello and welcome to Dateline London. I'm Geetha Gurumuthi. It's become the new conventional wisdom that the polls cannot be trusted. In the US, the latest polls give Joe Biden a large lead, as much as 16 points in the popular vote at the last count. Well, perhaps the unwritten story is that the polls may be right. If so, then we may be underestimating the scale of a Biden victory. In 1980, Ronald Reagan won a victory over then Jimmy Carter, taking 44 seats to President Carter's six. The split in popular opinion at that time was about 51 to 41 percent to Reagan. And that is in similar to territory at the moment, with a split now between Biden and Trump, where Joe Biden is at around 52 percent to President Trump on 42 percent. While the president may yet recover, of course, which is what he appears to have done from the coronavirus this week, according to him at least. The mere six days after contracting the virus, the president is back at work, proclaiming that he has the cure that he wants to roll out across America. Handling COVID is not that easy, though. There have been signs of revolt against restrictions this week in Brooklyn in the US, in Israel, in Madrid and in the north of England, to, make, to name just a handful of places. Well, to make sense of all these at a very difficult time, I'm joined today by Agnes Pare of L'Express in France and Geoffrey Kaufman, the North American writer and broadcaster. And here in the studio, at a social distance, is my colleague Clive Mari. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Well, as they stand, the polls in the US do suggest a comprehensive victory for Biden in the Electoral College of something like 279 to 125. Can that really be right, Jeff? pretty clear that if the election were held today, it would be right. In fact, it would be, as you, as you said in your intro, it would be actually much stronger than that. Uh, if it were held today, uh, it's quite reasonable to expect that Biden would have a landslide in the very complicated electoral college that determines who wins the presidency in the United States. Uh, that 16-point poll you talk about, the CNN poll, uh, is, is uh, the, the largest gap, but almost every poll in the last two weeks has put Biden more than 10 points ahead of Trump. It is hard to see how Trump can turn this around. In fact, he has really had one of the worst weeks of his presidency. Uh, uh, the debate last week was a disaster for him. His bullying did not win him fans. And his, the way he has handled coronavirus, seen himself above uh, standard health protocols and dismissed uh, reasonable behaviors has alienated so many more people. Uh, and in fact, what we're seeing now in the polls is a larger spread than ever. Agnes, of course, we have been burned by the polls before in, in you know, the UK and the US, and this is still very febrile. Could there be you know, the cliche of try shy voters that is still out there? There are still lots of Trump flags we know across the US. It's, it's dangerous to call it, isn't it? Yes, and the margin of error the problem is it can go either way. It can be a Joe Biden landslide victory, but it can also be a narrow uh, Trump win. Um, I mean, there, there are a few things that uh, are very positive. For instance, the number, I think it's almost 8 million uh, of American voters that have already cast their ballot by mail, I think, and that's the highest ever number at this point in the election cycle. So that's one thing. Also, there are little you know, signs that um, on the personal level, at least, Joe Biden is extremely popular with uh, a very key part of the electorate, that is to say the other 65. That's that was the case with Trump, actually, against uh, Hillary Clinton four years ago. So, you know, we, we are likely to see a Joe Biden victory, but uh, we have to be very careful. Um, also, there is one thing I'd like to, to, to do, because covering Trump's, you know, as a political commentator, the last four years have felt so toxic. Just uh, and now it's literally toxic for people uh, going to the White House. We've seen workers in their protective, you know, protective suits sanitizing the White House. If only they could sanitize the whole U.S. elections um, and and the U.S. politics. Um, and I think it'd be good perhaps to project ourselves in the future and to to think about the fourth of November uh, and to to see what a Trump victory or a Biden victory could actually mean uh, uh, for the rest of the world. But perhaps we'll do that uh, slightly later in the programme. Absolutely. We will come back to that in a moment, Agnes. I just want to bring in um, Clive Mari because obviously uh, people couldn't believe that Trump could win many, you know, around the world watching last time round. And he did. Uh, he clearly wanted to focus on the economy, at least in part. He's been derailed 
by the pandemic. Will his base give him some support, some sympathy on that account? There is a solid 35 heading up to 40 percent who will back the president no matter what. And they see him as the man who has taken on the interests that they don't like, whether it's liberals, whether it's the left, whether it's, in some cases, African-Americans, um, foreigners, immigrants. But that is something that they value. And Donald Trump reaches out to those people and he gives them what they want. This election is not over until it is over. There is no question about that. And we have to remember that Donald, Donald Trump is an incredible campaigner. What he needs is the other side of the argument. Those people who are soft Biden supporters, they're not that enthused with him. And there are lots of people who aren't, frankly. Um, but they do see him, obviously, as an alternative to Donald Trump. But there are many who are not enthused enough, potentially, to actually bother voting at all. And what Donald Trump needs to do, and we, we're going to see that with um, his uh, White House appearance later on today. We're going to see that next week with his, um, he says, with his rallies, um, which will restart and kick off again in Florida. We're going to see him beginning to reach out. I think he's probably learned some lessons, although it's, it might be <laughs> tricky to say that. But I suspect he may have learned some lessons in the last three or four weeks that he has to go beyond his base. He has to start speaking in more emollient terms. But they've pulled out funding, haven't they, in, in part of the Midwest, I think, places like Wisconsin, which suggests that he's actually trying to shift back to it to, you know, promote his base. Well, you've got to have your... You've got to, the, the base is the bedrock of any campaign. Now, there are many people who, uh, who are in the Democratic Alliance who aren't that keen on Kamala Harris because of her time as a prosecutor in California, for instance. You've got people who are not that keen on, on, on Joe Biden because they don't see him as left wing enough. If they perhaps are the ones who do not come out and Donald Trump manages to secure his base, then he's still got a fighting chance. It, it is always fascinating, isn't it, Agnes, that the turnout question in America, as much as it sort of dominates global interest, um, it's only about half the voters actually show up. And that is going to be a key issue, isn't it? If we look at the vice presidential debate um, this time, how much does uh, Kamala Harris bring people in? I mean, you know, given the age of the key candidates, the vice presidents matter this time, don't they? Well, at least, I mean, Kamala Harris is, uh, let's say... Uh, left to center. I mean, she's a centrist. Um, and so is Joe Biden. Now, as Clive is saying, if they're not left enough for some of the voters, then, you know, good luck to America. Um, and uh, the turnout is key. Absolutely. When you think that, you know, if, if I just compare to the presidential elections in France, where usually the turnout is in the, in the high 80s, um, of course, it's not the same system. Uh, but still, you, you think that Americans should care especially after those four years. So let me be slightly optimistic. I'm just hoping that at least 60%, uh, that would be good, of the Americans uh, care to uh, cast their ballots, because otherwise, you know, the whole world is going to be impacted. Je Jeff Goffman, I know you've been following the polls very closely. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in, obviously, the overall numbers for the Democratic Party, but also... Does Kamala Harris bring in the African Caribbean vote, the Indian vote? That's that, that's part of her own personal heritage. Because there are other factors, aren't there? The Indian Americans, for example, were quite pleased by the Modi Trump alliance. You know, she's seen by some of the African Caribbean uh, community, the African American community, as you know, as a prosecutor, which isn't necessarily totally helpful. I, I wouldn't want to overstate the role and the importance of the vice presidential uh, selection in uh, in a race like this. Uh, this is really all about Donald Trump. And, and I actually would disagree with Clive's comments uh, uh, about Trump reaching out. The, the, the base is, of course, critical, but Trump continues to pander to his base um, and has, doing not, has done absolutely nothing to reach beyond. He does not have the numbers with his base alone to win this election. He's got to get older people. He's got to get women. He's got to get university-educated white men. Those three constituencies are critical to win this election for him. It's what he got, he took from Hillary Clinton last time, in, uh, numbers that worked in his favor. Uh, everything he's done in the last two weeks and really the last four years uh, has alienated those groups. And so I do not see any sign of him pivoting in these last 24 days before November 3rd and, and putting himself in a position where he's going to suddenly get this stampede of people. And then, uh, as Agnes pointed out, 
a number of people have uh, a good percentage of people have already voted. But I think the sobering number in the poll is that actually nine out of 10 Americans have already made up their mind. There are very few people now to be persuaded uh, to, to change the outcome of this election. I think that what we really need to look look at, and, and you're right, it, it, we, we should be very careful about overestimating the accuracy of the polls. They were that they were off in 2016. I, I think it's also fair to say, though, that the social science of polling learns from its mistakes. And if you look at the key websites, the key places that, that, that uh, amass this, these, this data, uh, 538.com, the New York Times upshot, Real Clear Politics, there is a broad consensus of where these polls are taking, even if the factors that, that led to the mistakes of 2016 were, were put in place. Uh, this is really Biden's to lose. With the debate now delayed, it's unclear how many more debates we'll actually have. How is Trump going to get a broad message out to the, the American people that will actually change minds? It's pretty hard for him now. How much if Biden wins, by how much? Because if it is narrow, it could be very, very ugly. A, a replay of 2000 uh, and the Florida recount, but on a much more acrimonious scale. OK, we, we, I guess we'll come back to you for a quick look at uh, what this could mean uh, in, in terms of who wins. But Clive, a right to reply there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I suppose my point to Jeff is that um, certainly those on the Trump side would hope that he has learnt some lessons over the last three or four weeks. His poll numbers have sunk to some of their lowest levels of his, of his presidency. Um, and it has been a, a challenging time for him, and he's looking at defeat straight in the face. If there is ever going to be a change in his personality, it would have to be now. And I think um, his team have made it clear that he needs to be a bit more scripted. He needs to start reaching out. This is what they're telling him behind the scenes. And perhaps COVID has helped him realize that, you know, he could be leaving the White House in, in three or four months time. Um, now is the time to try and try and make an effort to get those people outside the base that he frankly hasn't paid much attention to for such a long time. Yeah, it doesn't look like he's, he's massively changing tackle, <laughs> does it? Agnes, just very quickly, your thoughts on, on obviously the rest of the world is watching this incredibly closely. What, what does the French want? What does Europe want? Well, look, if Trump wins, I think the next four years we'll see the US leaving NATO, uh, leaving South Korea, leaving Afghanistan, China uh, filling a much bigger role in the world and uh, Europe to fend for itself, which is not necessarily a bad a bad thing. Now, if Joe Biden is elected, I think a mistake would be, you know, no matter how much we'd like to go back to the world we knew four years ago, uh, before COVID, uh, before Trump, uh, this is not going to happen, even, even if Joe Biden is elected, um, because American society has changed, because the world has changed. Of course, Joe Biden will probably take the US back into the Paris agreements on climate change, back into the Iranian deal. Uh, but I suspect it's going to be you know, a quite tough president in terms of trade relations, for instance, with Europe, with China, and will not, not go back to the world order that we had set uh, after the Second World War. You know, it's a new generation in power. Joe Biden is not that new generation, but the American administration is. So I think a mistake uh, would be for Europe to think that, oh, God, we're, we, you know, we're getting the America of before Trump. No, Trump has changed the world and we now uh, will have to take it from there. Fascinating. I, we'll be talking more, obviously, about that in the coming days. But, of course, in this last week, President Trump did return to the White House from being hospitalised himself with COVID. He told us, don't let it dominate you. Don't be afraid of it. Last month in the UK, Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, told us to live without fear. Are they right? And are they nodding towards or even partly responsible for the types of revolts we're seeing against restrictions? Well, Agnes, is President Macron uh, facing revolts over the closure of these Paris cafes that <laughs> we all adore? Or has he managed to dodge blame a bit by devolving quite a lot of decision making on this? Well, first of all, I can reassure you the cafe culture is not dead in France and certainly not in Paris. My local cafe this morning was open. And um, 
actually, as, as you know, if, if cafes and brasseries can have their kitchen uh, fully functioning, operating, then they can still open and they take part in the tracing system now, uh, which is probably a good thing because the state, as uh, indeed in the, in the UK, uh, have found taste and tracing uh, pretty challenging. Um, so, look, yes, President Macron has sort of, you know, uh, um, uh, is not on the front line of COVID anymore, is putting his prime minister, Jean Castex, and the health minister, Olivier Véran, to actually uh, be on that front line of COVID because uh, President Macron goes to uh, Lebanon, he goes to Vilnius in, and is very busy uh, on the European front as well. He's living it to Jean, Jean Castex, very much a, a man of the Southwest with a rather um, adorable and heavy uh, regional accent to deal with it and to devolve powers, if you'd like. So it's very, uh, it's very legitimate, Jean Castex, when he tells uh, Marseille, for instance, or other cities to, uh, to actually uh, come up with more uh, uh, restrictions uh, in order to, to fight COVID. So, so all in all, uh, and strangely compared to what we've seen in, in Madrid or even in Berlin or uh, in the UK, there is no rebellion, uh, as it were, against uh, the new restrictions. And there, there is very much actually a sense that we have to live uh, with COVID, to learn how to live with COVID, and that a few places have been made sacrosanct. They will be the last to close, and that's the schools, because I think in France, but also in Europe, we've discovered over this uh, spring that children needed to go to school. They are not the super spreaders that we thought at first that they were, and that uh, their parents uh, need their children to go to school in order for them to have some sanity, but also some time, and to be able to uh, work and therefore sustain the economy. The do, other thing Agnes, I'd I'm like just going to say, just yes. going to bring in Jeff if I can. We absolutely need our children to go to school. I second that completely. Um, Jeff, you've I know you've been to Canada uh, this summer. Um, you know, who gets the blame for these revolts against the restrictions? Is it human nature? Is it the culture of different countries? Or is it political leadership? I think it's a fascinating question. I think the answer is a lot of it, it's really all of the above. I, I think that uh, one of the things that's very clear when you look at where the revolts are and how they're happening is that is that a lack of clarity and consistency in messaging uh, really undermines the government's authority. And, and that's clearly very apparent sitting here in London, uh, where, where Boris Johnson has really never recovered. Uh, from coronavirus himself and, and what it did to his government. Uh, saying that he's got his mojo back, I don't think anybody believes it. And, uh, you know, I don't even know candidly what the rules are. Uh, I'm, I, I know that I'm not meant to go out with have, be with more than six people. I don't know how many people in an office are allowed to, uh, to, to gather. The, the rules, it, 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 it's a quarantine roulette for travelers, who, who, what countries are on, what countries off. I think in, you, you see in France, you see in Canada, more consistent messaging and therefore uh, more consistent compliance and ad adherence. There is a cultural factor. There's no question. You see that profoundly in the U.S. I think in Israel, where, where we're seeing uh, revolts and, and uprisings against the government, uh, the government doesn't have the moral authority over the people that, that and that precedes uh, coronavirus. It's undermined by the, the, the mixed messaging and, and the, frankly, the very divided society there. So, you know, I, I think it, it is all of the above. I, I think here in the UK, there's just there, there is a real problem. The government does not have a handle on this. And it has you know, all those bluster, the promises of world beating this 200,000 tests a day that uh, nobody believes it anymore. And 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 so it, it's really impossible to feel uh, that you should uh, be a, a good citizen. I, I've traveled a number of times out of the country and, and, and had to quarantine. They don't even check you at the border when you come in through Heathrow. I mean, it's astonishing. It, it's shocking. You know, you could do all the right forms. You do everything. You go, oh, well, are they going to make sure I do this and that? Nope, it doesn't happen. So it's really a kind of quarantine. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's a game that they're playing of appearing to do the right thing in this country. And people are, are on to it. And so they're making up their own rules. Clive, I just wonder whether all governments politically are going to get punished whenever they face the election, if they face democratic vote, um, because handling this stuff is incredibly complex. They're balancing the economy and health, as we keep hearing. 
And mm. surely we all know the rules. We've got to work it out for ourselves at some point. We can't keep blaming the authorities, can we? Yeah, there's a certain amount of personal responsibility. And I think a lot of governments are... Um, I suppose, erroneously in some cases, but expecting their citizens perhaps to do the right thing. And where they believe that might not happen, then there are going to be sanctions. And we've seen that brought in here in the UK, stiff fines if you um, are not quarantining when you should be, that kind of thing. I mean, I suppose in defence of Boris Johnson, he would argue, and the government would argue, that this is an unprecedented situation. And governments all over the world are having trouble dealing with this. You know, the plaudits were being, that were being levelled at the Germans, and Macron certainly in the last sort of uh, five or six months or so, uh, Spain, Italy, we're seeing an increase in the infections in all those countries now. Um, obviously, compare Britain to the United States. No one, nowhere near as bad as that. There is well, much the more. are very low. That's true. We don't know whether yeah. we can totally trust the numbers, obviously, and yeah. they've clamped down very hard. Yeah, clamped down very hard. But India, the next second most populous country on earth, mm -hmm. um, the numbers are skyrocketing. Um, so... Governments around the world are having trouble dealing with this unprecedented event, uh, and, and, and they're having trouble finding their feet, and it's taking time. But as I say, Boris Johnson and the government here would argue that they're now talking to local authorities more. They've extended the furlough scheme, for instance, which during the summer saved hundreds of thousands of jobs. There are things that they've got right, and they've started... They're not start calling it a furlough, of course. They're <laughs> not calling it a furlough. It's now two-thirds, not 80%. But they have managed to keep businesses afloat. And in some parts of the world, that hasn't happened. Yes, absolutely. Clive, thanks very much indeed for that. Well, finally, in the desperate search, at least for me, for something to lighten the mood as winter sets in in the Northern Hemisphere and certainly in London, what has caught your eye this week? Agnes, tell me, have you found something to cheer us all up? Absolutely. I've just returned from Venice uh, to do what? To look at the Mose, as they call it, Moses, the flood barrier that have been in the making, the building for decades. At least it feels like it. And uh, I don't know if you remember also so much corruption, people behind bars, uh, but it worked. It was a historical uh, day last weekend for Venice because the high tide was uh, prevented uh, to flood Venice. And it was only a year ago that uh, almost two meters high uh, of water uh, completely inundated uh, the historical city. So, yes, it's a huge relief, huge satisfaction. Venice is going to be dry. Wonderful. Can you compete with Venice and Paris within the space of a couple of days, Jeff? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to go in a completely different direction, and, and I just want this to stay between the four of us. Uh, but but I, I have to say <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that, my, that, that, that I have to t tip my hat to the producers of the Great British Bake Off. I know it was a BBC program. It's now Channel 4. But in the midst of all of this chaos, there is something, it is true, very comforting about the fact that they've managed to create a bubble to pull that program together and to, to have the kind of delightful joy. And I think the best of British uh, uh, gamesmanship coming through, uh, you know, it is not a vicious, nasty, uh, competitive show. Uh, it's just good, wholesome fun, and it's done with a sense of humor. Uh, and and it, there's something really re reassuring that you can turn on your television once a week right now and see this this sort of slightly inane but playful and really distracting uh, <laughs> TV show continue as it has for the last decade. That is lovely, lovely to hear. My my brother's a Channel Four person, so you're allowed to you're allowed to plug them. <laughs> Clive, what what's been putting a smile on your face? Yeah, I, I totally agree with the, the Great British Bake Off. Great BBC program, completely nicked by Channel Four. But that's <laughs> that's how it happens. That's how it happens. I'm going to go with the Queen's Birthday Honours list. Usually you get political flunkies, you get apparatchiks, you get um, donors, you know, the flunkies of the political world who end up getting all these gongs. And this year, because of COVID, it is nurses, it is social workers, and it's people like Marcus Rashford who managed to convince the government to change policy and, in, and uh, continues free school meals for 1.3 million children. This is the best Queen's Birthday Honours list for a long, long time. Wonderful to hear that, Clive. I completely agree. And um, Agnes, we were talking when I spoke to you on the phone a little earlier this week about music. I think um, I personally am really missing seeing live opera. So I was thrilled to see the ballet start on stage live again at the Royal Opera House. And you're telling me that um, in France, you think they've managed to keep live arts performances alive a bit more. 
Yeah, that's what I was going to say, that the second sacrosanct places uh, in, in France, apart from the schools, and I think the last uh, to, to close, if there is another massive lockdown, it's what? Theatres, museums, uh, concert halls uh, and cinemas, because it's, of course, places where we don't talk, so we don't spread the virus so much. But it's also so vital. I mean, you know, films, literature, uh, but, but also music is what has sustained most of us during the lockdown. So, yes, we need to help the creative industries, and, and France is doing it, Italy, Germany, but I wish the UK was supporting uh, its artists more, because we need them desperately. Jeff, one live thing that you'd love to see, just in a couple of sentences? Oh, I would love to go back to live theatre. I, I, I agree. I, I think, you know, I live in London, you know. I, this, is, this is the capital, of the world capital of great theatre, and, and it, it, it pains me. And I think Agnes is right. Uh, this, the, the hundreds of thousands of people whose livelihoods depend on this, uh, and, and the skill sets that have been built up over, over generations, uh, that are just languishing right now. It is devastating, and 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 it's not all going to come back. And we, we've got to find ways to bring it back. Uh, you know, if we can go to pubs and sit in a pub in London, why can't we sit in a theater? Uh, you know, there has to be a way to, to do this. And and if this goes next summer, I fear for what will be what we'll have at the end of it. Absolutely. I saw Eunice Kaufman at, the, at Covent Garden. That was my last live thing. And I'm so glad I managed to get that in just before it all shut down. Thank you all so much. Agnes, Jeff, Clive, really grateful to you for your time today. And uh, we are, of course, here next week. It'll be Sean next week and the week after, but I'll be back sometime after that. See you soon. Bye bye.